Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Sign up for GoToMeeting and use the promo code START to receive your free trial. And by SourceBits. Visit SourceBits.com to begin your mobile app development journey. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody, it's Jason Calacanis. You're listening to This Week in Startups, and I wanted to tell you about SourceBits. SourceBits is an amazing firm in San Francisco that does design-led engineering and design for mobile apps, and they're a big supporter of our program. They're backed by Sequoia Capital, same folks who backed me, Google, Yahoo, Apple, a bunch of other great companies. Um, and this is a great company. They do great apps for companies like Hershey's, Coke, and GE. I just went to take a look here. I took a double take. My God, these are great companies, Hershey's, Coke, and GE. And hey, they showed us a, um, a really new app that I wanted to show you today because I was particularly impressed by it because it solved a lot of needs that I had. And here is their app. It's called CloudOn. Um, and this is an app they did for a client, apparently. And what they, it does is it's exactly what I was looking for for iPad, which is I can connect my box, which I have, my Dropbox, which I have, uh, and is my main sort of storage, and then Google Drive, which I'm now using. And you can open up any of the uh, files you have and then look at them in Microsoft Word or whatever it is. And so here I can um, click over and I can look at all the files that are in this week's in, this weekend. Oh, and there's the makeup request form. And I can open this Excel file in Cloud On and actually see it. Uh, and it takes a second to load. And then uh, I can also start new documents in here, which I thought was fascinating as well. So if I want to start a new document, I can do that. And what a great idea to take all of those features um, that you would normally get in one program and put it into three, and it's got beautiful design. And I was just noticing, you know, if I just click on Microsoft Word here, I can say, you know, build a new test document, and boom, I got a new document, and I can put it in any one of those three places. What a great solution, elegant, simple, clean, um, and uh, brought to you by our friends over at SourceBits. They do a great job. I highly recommend you take a meeting with them uh, if you're doing anything related to mobile or anything um, where you need extra development help. And let's, let's all face it, as entrepreneurs, we know we need help. These, we need professionals to, to augment sometimes uh, our staffs and our teams because, you know what, there's so much opportunity out there that you're going to need the help of outsiders sometimes just to catch up. And there's competitors out there that you're competing against, and they're out there developing, and they're using different... Uh, consulting firms, and you're going to need an edge, and SourceBits is that is that edge for you guys. And you can see how beautiful that product was. They can do that for you. They can make a beautiful product that solves a big need and really earn their keep as uh, your partner. If you take a meeting with them, you will get a meeting with me. That's a pretty co cool deal. And I think the way um, you can do that is just email sourcebits at thisweekend.com. Just email sourcebits at thisweekend.com if you want to take a meeting with them. And then you get a meeting with me, which is a pretty cool deal, right? You get a, a meeting with me if you take a meeting with them. And I'm willing to do that because I know that they do such a great job that I really want to support them and see their business grow because they're helping me with This Weekend Startups. And I know the team there, and I wouldn't steer you wrong. They're great folks. They're highly talented, and they're going to do a great job for you. So once again, thank you, SourceBits, for making beautiful apps like the one we just showed today, uh, Cloud On. And thank you for supporting my audience when they need help. And thanks to my audience for thanking them on Twitter, Facebook, and Google. Go ahead and thank at SourceBits for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups. This program could not exist without the support of folks like SourceBits. And these, the team over there has been great to us, and um, we really appreciate it. Go ahead and check out uh, everything they have to offer. Take a meeting with them. Email sourcebits at thisweekend.com and follow them at sourcebits on Twitter, sourcebits.com. What a great company, design-led engineering at its best. Thank you so much, SourceBits, and we'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Uh, so we're very excited to have our next uh, speaker here. Um, he doesn't really need an introduction. Um, those of you who've had an Atari or gone to Chuck E. Cheese uh, know his work, and um, he's 
just had an incredible uh, impact on the technology space and certainly with kids and gaming. Um, and he's going to show us the project he's working on and then also have a dialogue with us about just education in general. And his views are um, really uh, insightful and inspiring. We got a taste of them last week in the uh, rehearsals where he um, didn't have to come but came and just sat with the founders and had some really, um, a really great discussion. So uh, please welcome me in joining no Nolan Bushnell. Thanks. If I don't piss half of you off, I'm not pushing it hard enough. My objective is to always try to push the boundary a little bit, challenge assumptions, and have you scratch your head a little bit. As we know, education is really messed up. This can't work. All students are different, and to batch them all together is really stupid. And yet that's what we do. Brain science knows that we're all different. What do we do about it? This clearly is the model. Maybe it's not thousands, but it's definitely 30s and 50s. And it's, it's a batch process that comes right out of the industrial age. Then we know this. This is the attention span of a typical kid. Uh, this was done by uh, some guys at, the, at New York University. And if you'll notice, 20 minutes in, you're down to 25% engagement. That means that everything that's above the line is a total waste of time. The teacher is wasting their time. The kids are wasting their time. So this is not the solution. And you know, teacher in a box isn't the way to do it. What we really want to be able to do is change the paradigm. We have another big problem. Yeah. Have you ever seen this before? Homes are always a good investment, easy loans to the masses, no moral hazard in the decisions, because the government guaranteed it. Now we have college degrees always make you more money, easy loans to kids, which used to be illegal until you were 21, no moral hazard decisions. What that's done is allowed a very sloppy, inefficient, terrible higher education industry to exploit kids at a time when they have not developed the reasoning to make long-term decisions about their life. And the result, in the housing market, we're kind of experiencing that, kind of. Indentured servitude. And that's real, guys. Turns out that 40% of college graduates in 2008, before the recession, only 40% were engaged in occupations that used their degree. If you take out the hard sciences and teaching, it's down to 17%. So all the rest of the kids had an 80% chance of wasting the fifty dollars to $100,000 of student loans that they put in. The net result, this is what we call an indenture. You used to could, for a better life, go into indenture, they'd lend you the money, and you had to basically be a, a slave for seven years. This is another one. This was outlawed 200 years ago. For adults. And now we've got 18, 19, 20 year olds that are getting into debt that is unsustainable. And we really, I, I believe it's toxic and wrong. And they're talking right now about upping the interest rate to 6%. So 6% of $100,000 is all of a sudden a double house payment. That's wrong. The premise is wrong also. Everyone should not, should not go to college. Some should, but a lot of people shouldn't. And a lot of the dropout that we have in our high schools today are really because the kids have self-diagnosed and said, 
since this school is all about getting me in college and I'm not going to college, this is a waste of my time. Here's the real question. Everyone should get the job skills that they want or that society wants. I'm not going to answer that here, but until we answer that question properly, we're not going to be able to fix our school system. It also needs to be as cheaply delivered as possible. That means we've got to get the inefficiency out. And that means a total redesign. Computers do not help industries until they redesign their workflow. Schools have resisted it, and now they need to. Another big shift. Before credentials were important, a degree, an authorization, an MBA, what have you. It's moving slowly to experience, and it's going to end up at merit. And merit is the ultimate arbiter. At Atari, we hired for, for enthusiasm. The 2600 that you guys have all played was designed by a high school dropout. OK? Now, he trained himself. He was really good. He was very creative. Wonderful guy. The other th big change is subjective versus objective. Right now, most of the grades that everybody gets tend to be more subjective. The computer can make this very objective and efficient. We're pro approaching a singularity and a perfect storm. And the perfect storm is this education landscape will explode in the next five years in some very surprising ways. And these are the ways I think it goes. We know that all students are unique, and so we're going to have a massive amount of, of individualized instruction. We, we put them together in a lecture. Yeah, go next. That slides out a little. Learning is best is when a student's active. Sit still and be quiet. That's pretty stupid. Go ahead. And what we really want to do, and you're going to hear a lot about this in the future, is thalamic engagement. Thalamus is the thing that sits on top of your brain stem, and it, it governs everything that you, every activity that you do. It turns out that when you engage your thalamus and you're active, you learn better, you learn faster, and you remember it longer. Sitting and looking at a lecture, even reading, watching a movie, watching a, a, uh, a, uh, um, a video, it's all passive. And, and Khan Academy may be a great lecture, but it's not active, unless you call pushing the pause button active. <laughs> now, brain science is going to rule. And the brain science is very clear. Active, movement, spaced repetition, adaptive, all those things work. They work really, really well. Let me make some predictions. All high school students will have work skills. If you really want a good job right now, just learn 3DFX and go down and work for Pixar or, um, or uh, you know, DreamWorks. Turns out that they are constantly looking for graphic artists. And a high school student that spends six months learning those skills can get a job, 80,000 a year. Our, our, none of the high schools I know are teaching this. Why? How many, how many English classes are teaching science fiction? No, they want to prepare our life, our students for life in the 18th century England. You know, we're going to be continuously learning throughout our lives. K through gray is absolutely real, and it's going to be cheap and powerful and effective. All students will learn at their own pace. That's what our software is going to do. And your software is going to do. And everybody's software is going to do it, or you'll be dead. 
And then the part that I love, creativity will flourish, because that's where all the good ideas. Creativity is about inventing the future. That's what I want to do. Here's the one that's going to piss you off. By 2018, there will be zero dollars, this is a public school, for textbooks. Zero. There will be zero dollars for learning software. Now, I probably torpedoed an awful lot of business models right there. But I think that the schools will be willing to pay for results. Very different. Understand that there is difference between teaching and learning. And if you're not focusing on learning and results, you're toast. Labor will be much more efficient because, oh, all of the extra money that is going into textbooks and everything will go for hardware. And don't forget hardware maintenance. Believe it or not, iPhone and iPad screens break. And all of that is going to be paid for by somebody. Why are teachers going to become massively more efficient? Because teachers are best at explaining things that are confusing. And if all the heavy lifting is done by software, the teacher being there right at the time when the student is confused, it's really good. And that's really good because another thing, right now teachers spend between 20 and 30 percent of their time on discipline. That's boring for students. It's boring for teachers. Get rid of it. No forum. You know, if you're a, if you're a screw up and you want to be funny, be disruptive. I'm a prime example. I was really. Never mind. I won't go there. <laughs> um, paperwork and grading. Ask yourself this: If students can shop for a teacher. What do they shop for if the teacher isn't grading them? Bingo. They will be seeking the best explainer they can. Teachers advise on projects and project-based things, building stuff, doing research, having fun like that. That is really good stuff. And that's what our kids need to do because Tool use is actually neurogenic. You build your brain. Projects cause creative problem cells. They, they build your brain, and they're rewarding, and they, they create passion. And that's really what we want. If we can have our kids maintain the passion that they had the first day they came to school, we train that passion out of them. That's wrong. And of course, Socratic discussion is really fun. But there's no Socratic discussion in a room of 35 kids. Maybe eight, maybe 10, but no more than that. And by having a lot of the kids doing screen time, we can afford it. We also need to have appropriate exercise. Turns out that most of the problems of ADHD and and other issues of mood and depression could be removed by having aggressive exercise. There's also this thing called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. If you exercise aggressively for 20 minutes at the beginning of the day, everything you learn will be put into a little bit of hardware in your brain. Massively powerful. You integrate it with learning, and you start, the, start lifelong active patterns. This is today. Notice all the lecture time, which is the stupidest use of students' and teachers' time ever. This is time and hours in 20, 2018. Notice how much screen time. Notice how much project time. Notice how much lecture time. A very, very different model than we have right now. So you've got to build your model into figuring out where you're going to be playing. This is a little bit more detailed. I actually put in 2015. This is how it'll go. Notice how much time one-to-one -one happens in 2018. Some people believe it may go up to a half an hour. This is going to depend a little bit on 
on budgets because that's clearly going to be a lot of where the teachers spend their time. Okay. <coughs> let me, excuse me, let me talk a little bit about resistance change. This is basically a differential equation, and what you really want to be able to do is if you resist change too much and have too fast a to fall time, you will always have overshoot. That's destructive. That's where things break up and blow. Let me talk about the education market. I'm running out of time. <laughs> Am I it's going good? Okay. 5% of the world's GDP in general is focused on education. No matter how poor the country, they tend to spend 5% of GDP. That's over a trillion dollars in the U.S. alone. The current system is massively inefficient. We are getting so little for that trillion dollars, it's remarkable. And, and the thing about it is help is on the way, and you guys are doing it. Um, the change is res very restrictive, and we have the perfect storm. It's a combination of the hardware being available and cheap, networks being available and cheap, the cloud being there and available. It's really, really good stuff. And somebody is calling me, but... <coughs> okay. Next one. I'm sure you know this company. It's free. And you get to build a farm. Um, but you have to buy a cow. Wikipedia. It's free. And it costs zero to create content. This is the pent-up demand for supplemental education. And you can always calculate these things because if you have something that costs zero and a certain number of people spend fifteen to fifty thousand dollars to opt out of public education, you can fill in that triangle, estimate the number of people that are in that never never land, and you can calculate it and it comes out to be six hundred million dollars. Or six hundred billion dollars. That's a lot of money. I'm I miss that's the point on that. It, it's <laughs> it's it's six hundred billion dollars plus. Anyway, um, Next slide. The education market, talked about it. Next slide. This is our school. This is the way it's going. Next slide. We change the learning process. Lecture homework, lecture homework, test on Friday is the typical metric. That's a big waste. We turn it all into play. And play is much more effective because you're totally active. We have a response every seven seconds. And what is the net result? It is highly, highly effective. We are currently uh, teaching in front of 50,000 kids. Next slide. Um, and they're learning three to five times faster. And it's getting faster every day. Funny thing about it, the faster you can teach kids, the more fun they think it is, even though the games look like crap. Now, wh why is that? Well, it's because they're engaged. And I, I would recommend that you all look at Makai Chichimihai's TED Talk on flow. It's what we've been doing in video games all the time. It turns out that if you're in the state of flow, you learn faster, you're the happiest you can ever be, and it's a matter of tailoring difficulty and ease and put it right in the middle so that you can just barely make it to the next level in the game. The Brain Rush platform, we're doing all kinds of things in terms of, of various items. Our, our alpha test has been in Spanish language and we, we have kids now that are, have learned Spanish vocabulary ten times faster than their peers, you know, and now we'd like to do a little bit of a, of a demo to show you what it is. And what it is, it's really about spaced repetition. This is where, anybody know where Suriname is? Well, you will now. Uh, 
and essentially what you do, go ahead. Okay. Um, so can we flip it over to me here? So I'm just going to give a quick demo of Brain Rush and some of the ideas behind it. So what we're building is an online community uh, of supplemental lessons. So supplemental lessons meaning that they're a perfect supplement complementary to all the existing curriculum as well as what teachers are doing. The idea here is that every lesson is a mini game that takes the typical student 10 or 15 minutes of play to master um, and that the games can be across a lot of different platforms. What I'd like to do is just show you one game and tell you a few things about some of the unique features of the way these games are designed. So here's a game for students to learn the names of the countries in South America. Um, in this case, w when they first get in, they can kind of just roll over and see the names of the countries. Brazil. Click and hear how the country is. But the real power is in learning. You learn through play. And the way you learn through play is you just click play. No, you don't really need instructions. You immediately get in, and you're immediately being required to guess which one of these is correct. You've got a very short period of time to respond. You respond. You start guessing. Every now and then, you guess right. Paraguay. As you start doing it, you're very, very quickly learning the names of the words because your brain is engaged in the process. What happens is, as you get better, the game will get harder and harder. You'll get more choices. You'll start, um, you know, it'll start going a little bit faster. And within a few minutes, I won't play too much, within a few minutes, you'll have, you will know the location and name of every country in South America in play. A very, very rapid process. When you finish that first stage, I'm not going to demo the second stage, you will go to a second stage where you actually have to type the name of every country. It'll highlight a country. It'll force you to type the name. Within about 10 or 15 minutes of play, the average student will know the location, the name, and the proper spelling of every country in South America. This is the interesting thing. When they finish playing, they know it, guaranteed, because we've combined presentation, practice, and test into a single step play. So I know, we know, not just what the students did, we know what the students know. When they're done playing, they know it right now, but they're going to forget it real soon. What we do is we build in automatic spaced repetition so that for those lessons the student wants to build permanent knowledge or that the teacher wants them to do that, the students have the option to do the reviews when the tool tells them to do it. As long as you do the reviews when the tool says so, then you're building long-term memory very rapidly and very efficiently. It turn, m many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with spaced repetition, but the bottom line with it is that if you space out the reviews exactly right, you can do a lot fewer reviews in order to build a more or less permanent understanding of that information. Now this is an example of four different lessons that we put up as samples. What's interesting about these four lessons is that it's the same game engine with different content. And one of the features that we're looking to add is the ability for teachers to add their own content to our game engine and the combination of those two creates a new lesson. Wikipedia. So what we in effect do is democratize the building of content so that these very efficient, high-speed, simple games become almost, uh, cost almost nothing to build and our community can build them. The other thing that we're doing is allowing teachers to customize the lessons that are assigned to the classes of students and monitor how the students are doing. So this is our platform um, that we're creating. And this is, world, this is worldwide. Remember that all the different subjects across the bottom axis, the difficulty from preschool to PhD and above on the vertical axis, language and culture on the Z axis. And it turns out that once you fill in all the blocks in that three space, we have a worldwide repository of knowledge. And we know what you know, when you learned it, how much spaced repetition, what the decay rate of your brain is, and we get a map of exactly what you know. We never present, then, things that you don't have the precursor information. So here's the big dream. Everybody learning all the time. Spaced repetition, a couple of hours a month, you will remember everything you learned in high school and college. Pretty and remarkable you might actually be a better human being. So 2018, near zero cost. Everybody is learning all the time, really effectively, very fun, anytime, anywhere, cell phones, iPads, what have you. This is high velocity learning. 
we really believe that we can get it maybe 20 times faster. Think about that. 20 times faster. That's, a, that's, that's more than an order of magnitude. That is big change. Fast is fun. And so this isn't drudgery anymore. Great value for time spent. Seven billion students. Where do you say seven billion students? That's the whole population. Bingo. I believe that the whole population of the world can, can, can be accessing this over time with remarkable results. Think of what happens if everybody is more educated than they are now. I believe that the world immediately jumps 5% in world GDP. Better life for everybody, less war, less famine, less pestilence, you know, and then we'll all have a party. <laughs> the golden age of capability is just around the corner, and we're going to create it. Awesome. So. Well, um, let's have a seat and discuss all this. And Tyler, maybe you can run a microphone for me. I'm sure some teachers will have some ideas and thoughts. Um, so I guess the first question everybody's going to have is, OK, this is great for memorization of you know, uh, uh, countries and capitals and presidents. But the criticism, of course, will be, well, how do you teach something complex? How do you teach themes of you know, Shakespearean plays and, and things that take the higher learning? Well, it turns out that much like software, we believe that we can building block up to a pretty high level to things that you would think is just rote memory, but is actually higher cognition. Example. However, yeah. Well, um, that would take too long to explain, because, yeah. and I don't even want to go there. Um, what I want to be able to do is, first step, just get the teacher out of the way for all the stuff that she hates. Or he hates. They hate. They hate. Yeah, I'm, I'm still old fashioned. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and by doing that, we make, I mean, the, the teachers that are using our, our vocabulary tool, they love it because now they can spend all their time. They actually speak Spanish from the day the kids jump into the class now, which they couldn't before. They're talking about grammar and syntax and all the stuff that they love to engage the kids with. And that's good enough. Right. And we believe, I mean, you know, think about biology. Not, you know, that's all space, spaced repetition, things like that. But then we have designs for set engines where the relationship between objects are important. We have a sequence engine where the order of things are important. These are getting very close to the higher cognitive values. Then we have a Boolean engine. Now, Boolean is a fancy word for learning rules and learning rules that help cognition. You can learn those, and once you do that, all of a sudden you can operate those rules on data sets and information. And you're getting damn close there. But, you know, hey. But even if you just get this first third or half done, that leaves the teacher for all that one-on-one -on -one time exercise Bingo. and projects. Right. So you said um, that one of the things that struck me was uh, no money for textbooks, no money for software, pay for performance. Does that mean uh, pay the software vendor or the service provider, the SaaS provider, software as a service provider, only when the child uh, or student has memorized all the capitals in the United States of every state? Yeah. And then they pay you a dollar per student. Remember. I believe that there are trends that are happening that are inescapable. And the trend is pay for value. Don't pay for, a t for, for trying. Don't pay for anything else. And so if a, a software vendor isn't willing to embrace the model, pay for results, you will not get any business. So just start to remodel your, your thinking about efficacy. If you're not effective, I don't care how pretty your thing is. If it's not effective, you will fail. Now, you can, it's the old story. You can fool some of the people some of the time. You can fool all the people some of the time. But you can't fool all the people all the time. And, and what's happening right now is reality is setting into the education world. And so you've got to find out what the reality is. And the reality is kids aren't learning enough for the money they're getting, that's being spent. And until that, and, and that is going to get fixed so fast, it'll make your head spin. Uh, what are your thoughts on 
actually paying students for completing the material. We see this great inefficiency. You talked about the software provider, the service provider, only getting paid for results. What about the students getting paid for results? Controversial topic. If you were president of the universe, is that something President Nolan would do? Everybody gets a dollar. I like God for, better, but that's yeah, just me. God, um, president of the universe, God king. Um, um, there is so much controversy on all that. And what I really believe is it comes back to all kids are different. Hmm. And if you're giving a dollar for an hour of homework to a kid from Beverly Hills whose, whose mother is Madonna, not yeah. very effective. Right. But if you give credits towards getting a new pair of Nikes to a, a, uh, a son of a single mother in Compton, you probably get a whole different thing. And I do know this, that if you get a lot of tickets to kids when they're eating pizza, they love the hell out of it. <laughs> yes, that's been, that's been proven by Chuck E. Cheese. So thoughts from the audience, and we have a lot of teachers here. I would be interested to hear questions, um, and then maybe even some of the kids in, who are here in the audience, what they thought of learning um, via um, the game and going fast. So feedback from our audience, teachers or kids. Wow, I think people are all taking that in. I generally scare the hell out of a lot of yeah. people. Just a quick question. How do you identify which kids should go to college and which kids shouldn't? It's not for me to, it's not for me to decide. The real, the real issue for me is to have the kids decide what would be a cool thing to do. Earn $80,000 a year right now working uh, for DreamWorks or should I finish high school? You know, that's going to be the kind of questions that we want to have kids be able to ask. Germany, right now, graduates 20% of the college graduates the United States does. But they have a really, really cool <laughs> apprentice program. For example, if you want to do something using a master machinist in the United States, there's nobody home. You can't get a uh, an injection molded tool built here. You can't do complex machinery. You have to outsource it. That's wrong because those are good manual skills that require a, a lot of training and a lot of imp import, and the nation needs them, but they're not being taught because somebody's learning paleontology so that they can be a cab driver. <laughs> Clearly. Uh, question for the audience. Yeah. Um, how do you keep the your games were very simple. How do you keep interest in it? I mean, the mechanics are really, really simple. You're just clicking the button. And I've noticed when I do games like that, I just click buttons and I don't actually learn anything. And maybe it's in the second stage where you actually have to type something you, in. You won't be able to do that with ours. Trust me, this, this thing is, it's all, it's all done by the wizard behind the curtain. And I'm never going to let you see the wizard. But it works. And it works really, really well. And we believe that, you know, I mean, you go to Wikipedia when you want to look something up. You'll go to Brain Rush when you want to learn something. And it will be the most effective thing that you can do. And it will actually stick it in your brain whether you want it or not. And, uh, and just play with our stuff. And if you, if you can honestly tell me that you can dick around with it and not learn Spanish vocabulary, you're wrong. We can, we'll find you out and we'll hunt you down. <laughs> <laughs> another question from the, oh, another question back there. Okay, and then we'll take one here and then one back there. Okay, so a uh, question up here first. Yeah, and who great. are you? What do you do? Uh, my name is Mario and I'm a founder of a startup. Okay. Uh, speak a little more. Yeah, hi, my name is Mario and I'm a founder of a startup. Um, I think it's a great uh, thing you're building. We we're actually talking at lunch about how something like this is needed. Um, one thing I was wondering, and it's sort of, um, came from uh, Marshall Tuck's talk yesterday about making sure that the tools we build um, serve everybody and include, for example, students in special education. So um, particularly those students who are most at risk. So how could your tool, or have you been thinking about how you make your tool accessible to students with visual impairments or physical disabilities who already struggle with the, the current technology, so the new ones that we're building, really need to be thought at the onset of uh, being usable. 
and autism and ADHD right. and all this stuff. That, oh, you know. autism, ADHD, love our shit, but um, <laughs> our stuff. There are kids here. Our wonderful, we have kids in the pristine, audience. wonderful thing. I'm sorry Sugar. about that. Um, I train my children to appreciate profanity, but that's another thing. <laughs> uh, it turns Use out it judiciously. It turns out that we have um, we we think that we are very good at the one sigma kids. We're also good at the two and the three sigma kids when it comes to learning and learning disabilities. Because spaced repetition is effective across the board. And so we think we're, we're really good there. When it comes to things um, like, like physical handicaps and things like that, we think we can adapt to it. Uh, we, have a, we had an email from a, or was it a call, a call from the car, kindergarten teacher? Why don't you tell that story? Kindergarten teacher about typing? Oh, we have a part with the typing, and the kindergarten teacher said, you know, is there, is there a way you can turn off the typing? Because my kindergarten kids are having trouble with it. And so, yeah, we can adapt it because, you know, kindergarten kids, bad muscle coordination, that sort of thing. They don't know. And how it to wasn't intended yet. for kindergarten kids. It I was not it. intended yeah. for it. Let's but take it, another it question. It shows here. the yeah. adaptation. Hey, uh, my name is Elise Musa. I'm the founder of a technology startup called B. It's a technology platform that enables students to learn and then earn money to help pay for college and earn other academically relevant rewards via a quiz application. My question to you is. Have you considered doing a pay for value for students so they can help to tackle the $25,000 average student loan debt, which is about a trillion dollars right now in this country? Um, yeah, and, and I, I actually like the idea with some kids to be able to reward them. And there's a lot of companies that are willing to, to put money into the till. And, and whether it's, it's for college or whether it's for a new pair of Nikes or whether it's for an iPad or, or a trip to Chuck E. Cheese. Um, yeah. um, we're going to be doing a lot of testing on that. And one of the things that we really like, since we know when you know it, we can do all kinds of stuff. Like, for example, how, what time of day was it when you learned this? Did you learn, do you learn faster in the morning or in the afternoon? Do you learn faster if you have a high protein breakfast? Do you learn better if you've exercised aggressively? We think we can answer more questions about education in the next five years than all of education research before has happened. And once we have all these things filled in, we can tune you like a, like a Stratus Various file in, and you'll be learning and happy. Let's take a final question in the back. Yep. Hi, my name is Ritu Jain. I'm a founder of Learning Jar. Uh, we are a platform to help people track all the disparate ongoing learning that they're going through yep. and prove that they've built certain skill sets and get a job with it. Uh, so we completely resonate with all your messages today, especially the bold message that by 2018, education will be happening in a different way. Uh, my question to you is more around the whole badges concept that's come up in the past couple of years. Um, you said that people are moving away from credentials and moving more towards merit, and I couldn't agree with you more. But there, are, yeah. there is a faction of society that's, take, that, that's taking credentials and making them into more badges, certifications to badges. And I wondered what your thought was around that. Badges, badges. yeah, badges, there's, there's an issue that I believe in, which is that a lot of times badges and recognition are doing the wrong things. They are motivating the motivated and demotivating the unmotivated. Uh, in our system, we actually believe in stealth scholarship, that everyone should compete against themselves, not against others. Now, to the extent that the badges are your private domain and you know, Zynga does a great job of filling up histograms, um, and we will be doing a bunch of that, and maybe we start giving you badges, but they're not going to be available to brag about, because I think that we need to get this idea of competition um, out of the schools a little bit, and let everyone be their personal best, because that's really the, the final an analysis of what we want to do, is we want to maximize the capability of the individual. 
And some kids are gonna take a little bit longer, some kids are gonna take a little bit shorter. I don't care, you know? All I want them to do is really be good at something that they get passionate about. And that will give them a happy life and hopefully a great job. On that note, let's thank Nolan for joining us. Everybody check out Brain Rush. Hey everybody, it's Jason Calacanis. This is the program This Week in Startups, and this program is brought to you by my good friends at GoToMeeting by Citrix. This is the product that I, Jason Calacanis, use every week. I use it multiple times a week. Why do I use it? Because I have to do a lot of meetings. That's like a third of my life is meeting with new entrepreneurs, existing entrepreneurs, other venture capitalists, angel investors, board meetings. These are very important meetings. There's a lot at stake. The future of companies, investments, and I need the meetings to start on time. I cannot tell you how many times I have meetings start 20 minutes late because somebody's using some free meeting solution or some free dial-up number they have, and it never starts on time. It's never reliable, and that's why I set all my own meetings. And I tell people, if you want to meet with me, I'm sending you a link to go to meeting, and you're going to make one click, and our meeting's going to start on time. It's going to be flawless, and it doesn't matter if you're using an iPad, an iPhone, Android, Windows, Mac, Firefox, Chrome. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It just works. And that's what I love about GoToMeeting. I need my meetings to start on time. I need to have perfect fidelity. I want that audio perfect. I want the sh screen sharing perfect. I want the chat perfect. And I want the video perfect. And they got that HD faces that looks gorgeous. Even people with crummy cameras, they look good in this. And they really spent the money and built really strong, solid, enterprise-level meeting software. And that's all they do. They focus like maniacs. They're maniacs over there, focusing on making your meeting go flawlessly. It's not an afterthought. It's not like they made an email program and threw in some chat software. It's not like they made free VoIP software and they threw in a little bit of uh, screen sharing. This is rock solid enterprise style. I use it and I will only take advertisers on this program that I personally use their products and love their products. And this is one of those cases where I can tell you with 100% certainty, you will be delighted with GoToMeeting. It just works. And that's what you need in business. You cannot have your meeting start late, especially if you're a young entrepreneur and you're up and coming and you're meeting with important venture capitalists. You don't want to go through this nonsense of free services that may or may not work. Use the rock-solid gold standard that I, Jason Calacanis, use multiple times a week, and that's GoToMeeting. And by the way, go to their Facebook page, which is very easy to remember, facebook.com slash GoToMeeting, facebook.com slash GoToMeeting. Go there and like their page. They're looking to get a little Facebook uh, action going there, a smart move on their part, and um, you'll get entered into a promo for a free iPad. So go over there and get one of those free iPads, facebook.com slash go to meeting. Hopefully you win their contest. And uh, if you want to use the software and you want to get it for 30 days free, a great 30-day free trial, which we thank them for, uh, use the promo code START, S-T-A-R-T, and start having a better life and start having meetings start on time and start building your startup. Start, 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 start with go to meeting. Those meetings got to start on time and they got to be rock solid and you can't have technology getting in the way. You've got to get technology enabling you to get the mission of the meeting done. And the mission of the meeting is not trying to figure out everybody's goddamn handle and who's not on the call and whose camera's not working and who didn't set their audio right. Get go to meeting and all those issues go away. I promise you, you will love it because I use it and I know that and I, I have to lecture people on this and I'm getting mental about it. I love go to meeting. And thank you to Citrix the makers of GoToMeeting for supporting This Week in Startups. I, that really means a lot to me. I appreciate it. See you next time. Our first speaker I met on a basketball court uh, in Los Angeles, and I asked him what he did, and he told me, uh, well, I work for the mayor of Los Angeles. I said, oh, what do you do? He goes, well, we took the uh, 22, I can't use the word worst, but the uh, most underperforming schools in Los Angeles. I said, well, how many students go to those schools? Oh, about 16, 17,000. Um, and uh, we took them over to try to make them better. And I said, wow, that, that's insane. You must have learned a lot doing that. And um, he has, and he's made a huge impact. And he's going to uh, share with us uh, a little bit of what he's done and what he's learned. It's probably nobody better to talk about taking technology into the public school system uh, than Marshall Tuck, who is the CEO of Partnership for Los Angeles Schools. Let's give him a big, warm welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, with a focus on taking the lowest performing schools in LA, our schools are all in Watts, East LA, South Central, schools that for decades have been underperforming 
and lifting those schools up. We have a contract with the school district where they've delegated authority to the Partnership for LA Schools to run these schools. Principals report to us. We are responsible for delivering results. We have a five-year performance contract to improve the schools. If we improve them, that contract gets renewed. If we don't, then we don't run the schools. Um, they're traditional public schools, but we have flexibility from district rules. So it's kind of, for those that are familiar with charters, it's trying to take some of the benefits of a charter school, combining that with a traditional district school, and trying to create a model that truly is scalable. Because in our country, our biggest challenge still exists in our urban schools throughout this country, schools that for a long, long time still serve the most kids and are having the biggest challenges. You're all in education. You probably understand the crisis we have in education. As a country right now, latest tests internationally, 50 industrialized countries, 19th in reading, 23rd in science, and 31st in math. That's where the US landed last year on international tests. The worst we have ever performed as a country since those tests have been offered. And what's been happening is our performance is flat while other countries are getting better every single year. So if we don't make some dramatic changes, we are in real big trouble as a country. Where I live in LA, we have 46,000 students start the ninth grade. Four years later, when those students graduate, only 7,000, 7,000 out of 46,000 actually graduate prepared for college. 15% of the kids that are starting schools in LA public schools are graduating prepared for college. And this is not unique to LA. This is what's going on in cities throughout our country. So it is a massive, monumental crisis. And that's why what's great about today's conversation, we're saying, how can technology help to change that game? Uh, and we have to completely and dramatically change the game in our public schools. Otherwise, we will not compete internationally as a country. And in my opinion, more importantly, millions of kids, which is happening today as we speak right now, are not going to reach their potential in this country because they're not getting a great education. Some of the issues to, to improve public schools we're not going to solve today. We have major funding issues in the state of California. We have significant issues with the work rules. There's not, not the, next, the necessary flexibility. And we don't have enough human capital. We don't have enough smart, committed, bright people who want to be teachers in the 21st century. We've got some real, real challenges that are long-term policy challenges. But there's incredible promise. And there's great promise because the kids are wonderful. You go to Watts, you're going to see kids that don't have any different DNA talent than the kids in Palo Alto. If you come with me to East LA, you're going to see young people that have the same desire to learn, the same commitment to want to learn, the same desire to be pushed in school, to be felt good about, to be challenged, as kids who are growing up right here. The DNA and the biology isn't different. The difference is we're not serving those kids effectively. And my perspective is thinking about the majority of high poverty neighborhoods in our, in our country. How do we serve them more effectively? This is where our organization, after four years, we believe technology is and truly can be a game changer for this. We spent two years doing the traditional stuff in our schools. We brought in better principals. We're helping the teachers get better at what they're doing, getting parents and community more engaged. But we saw our results improving, but not fast enough. We see ourselves moving faster than the state and the district, but the gap has got to be much wider in terms of our improvement if we want to get these kids to be at grade level in what they're doing and ready to go. And that's where we think infusing technology both in the classroom in terms of what the kids are learning and how they learn, as well as technology as a huge vehicle for helping teachers get better at what they do. And that's something that we don't have to wait for politics to actually catch up to us on. We can do it right now by doing things differently. So I'm going to tell you a little about what we've done, and then we'll pause, and, and Jason and I will have a conversation with you all about uh, the experiences and lessons learned. As I mentioned, two years of results that were getting better, but not where they need to be. Our, our mission is to dramatically accelerate student achievement, is to take the lowest performing schools and get them to the average and above over time. We said we got to shift things. Mathematics is where we started. Math, we are absolutely dying as a state. Three of four kids in our schools are not at grade level in algebra, 75%. When you go to geometry, you get down to 85% not a grade level. You go, when you go beyond that, you're talking about 95, 90% not a grade level. So we started in math. We invested uh, two years ago in a program called ST Math. It's launched out of the Mind Research Institute. And we did a pilot in two, in two schools, two of our elementary schools we did a pilot. Why elementary school? One, 
when you start earlier, especially in mathematics, you're able to give the foundation for the future. But two, and just as importantly, elementary school teachers are more open to change. They're just more used to collaboration than you often find in traditional big uh, public high schools and middle schools. So we start at the elementary school level, two schools, put ST Math in place, bought computers, bought the software, raised money to do so, and saw those two schools increase their performance by 25% in one year. It was the most improvement we've seen in a long time, the most improvement you've seen from public schools, high poverty public schools in LA in a long time. So we quickly said, hey, th this is something that makes a lot of sense, and we're seeing this in schools throughout. What was happening? One is if you go to a third grade classroom at Ritter Elementary, which is in the heart of Watts, where we, where we work, you have kids that may be at kindergarten or pre-K level. You may have kids at third and fourth grade level. How do we actually get to all of them in one class? That's where technology can give a very, very differentiated approach for our young people. You see some kids who just aren't feeling excited about learning. When they get an ST Math, it's a little program. It's got a little penguin. Gigi's a penguin. It's got really fun gaming technology integrating with the mathematics. The kids actually enjoy it. They're feeling good about learning. They get excited to actually go in the lab or to go in their classroom when we're organized in stations. And when they're excited about learning, not surprisingly, they learn. Teachers don't have great data. Think about education. For literally, if you go almost every class in this country, when you want to check for understanding, if I'm teaching, I'm talking to you right now. If I'm a teacher and I'm checking for understanding, I'm going to walk around. I'm going to look at the eye contact. Maybe I'll see what you're writing. And this is how I'm going to say, oh, these guys got it or not. Right? It's almost impossible to do in terms of understanding what's going on. If you are working on ST Math and I have a console table as a, as a teacher, I can see exactly where every single one of you are. And I can see if the lesson I just gave you or the thing we just worked on, if you got that or not. Think about the efficiency difference right there. From observation, testing your body language, maybe walking around a classroom of 30 people to see what you wrote in your notebook, to seeing in real time, did you get that problem or not? Where am I going to spend the next 30 minutes as a teacher? I'm going to spend on the areas where I know, because the computer is telling me, most kids got stuck. I'm not going to spend time on things where they aren't stuck. So we saw big benefits on getting data to teachers. And then one benefit we saw particularly in our schools, which may be a little bit different from private schools or even some higher net worth schools, was it helped change the belief system of the adults at the campuses. So a lot of times when you're working in high poverty schools, when you're in Watts or East LA, you have people who kind of, they've been working hard for a long time and they're not successful. And so your natural inclination is to say, well, it's the kids. It's not a good inclination. It's a bad thing. But it's insecurity and you do that. Oh, it's the kids. The kids are the challenge. Kids are misbehaving. They, they, won't, they won't get involved. They're, they're out of control in the classroom. But when you actually see the young people go on to ST Math, and they are smiling from ear to ear, nobody's throwing anything in the classroom. No one's off task. Kids are cranking and engaging, raising their hand when they need help. It tells people who don't say that those kids want to learn, you can't believe that anymore. And it forces you to self-reflect on your own profession as a teacher or an educator to say, hey, maybe it's actually not the kids. Maybe I got to work at how I can get better as a professional. So we saw six, incredible success, not just with the student data, but in terms of what we were seeing with kids and engagement and what we were seeing with teachers and using the data to improve their instruction. We said, let's scale this right away. This year went from two classrooms to all of our elementary schools and our sixth and seventh grade. 7,000 kids now on ST Math in the partnership for Los Angeles schools. Um, we had to raise significant money to do it because there's not enough computers. Um, it's a big effort in terms of getting the teachers involved and bought in, but when you have the right software program and when you work with teachers to implement it, particularly early on, then they're going to be your best possible salespeople to tell their peers what's working well, and they are without question the fastest way to think about large-scale implementation of software in schools. Significant success in math. ST Math goes kind of K through 7. So we said, hey, let's not just stop there. we got a lot of challenges in a lot of our schools. We have big, big challenges in reading and writing at the high school level and the middle school level. We invested in a program called Achieve 3000. Rather than doing the two classroom and the two school pilot, we said, let's go large scale right now. We 5,000 kids, middle of this school year, uh, we rolled out Achieve 3000 to. And the reason it was middle of the school year versus start of the school year, California, there is no money in this state right now for public schools. So we got really, really creative on how to actually find that money, both by trying to raise the dollars and then really looking deep at the budget in order to reallocate the dollars. 
Lessons learned from Achieve 3000. This is a software program, and I think this, it's kind of the nuances in the software program that I think make the most sense for the educators. Again, the kids loved it. They did a really good job of a reward system. So kids are getting consistent rewards when they read different when they're reading different articles and get to different levels. They really enjoy kind of that gaming logic built into their learning. They really like the reward system. And the teachers loved it because what this program does is it allows it's real-time content. So for English, it's really focused on developing your reading and writing skills. It has real-time content. So everyone reads the same content, but at very different skill levels. So one of the challenges as a teacher, if you're trying to teach kids uh, in a class, if you're a ninth grade teacher in English, and again, you're going to have a range from, in a ninth grade class at Mendez Learning Center in East LA, Boyle Heights, where we work, you'll probably have kids that are at the fifth grade level in reading, and you'll maybe have a couple at the tenth grade level. But what Achieve allows you to do is actually allows you to take real time content, let's say we're talking about the, kind of what's going on in Syria right now, and it'll customize that content based on your level. So the kids can still have the same conversation. There's not as much of that, oh, you're the smarter kid, so you're reading better content than I'm reading. It's actually same content, very different differentiated levels that the kids are reading and engaging on. And so we saw the kids really, really like it. And again, the teachers, it filled a big need for the teachers. It tells them where the kid's reading level is at and gives them real-time actionable tools that they can use to help educate those kids and help them to, to read, which is what they want to do. Uh, we've seen significant success. And like most things, I think, in technology, you want to get as much of the, like, not top-down, but kind of network effect. We expect this to be rolled out in English. English teachers were talking happily about it. It's already been moved into social science, and a lot of our special ed teachers are starting to use it because they're hearing again from their peers. So I think as we're all doing this work in education, the peer-to-peer, -peer, if you get teachers committed to it with a strong principal who's also supporting that, things will roll out at a much, much faster pace than if you try to force it through through kind of administrators, you know, folks like me in the suit and otherwise. So we've seen that success. We tried to launch also, and we're launching uh, math for algebra and geometry. It's a little harder. The more complex the subject, the little harder it gets because you're requiring more adult behavioral change. Challenge in schools is about capacity. You've got a sector that's been pretty isolated that has not been infused with technology for a long, long time. So things that kind of feel pretty natural to you and I, oh, that would be obvious, aren't as obvious. And so when you think about implementation, it's always got to be the extra step. We move very quickly with the algebra and geometry. Had to take a little bit of a step back because we realized that the complexity of the math combined with the newness of the software and the amount of adult behavioral change it required amongst the teachers, that we had to be smart about scaffolding that up. The good news is our partner in math, which is a group called Revolution Prep, they are providing a lot of service on the ground to the teachers. And I think that's the other thing. As you're thinking about software solutions, different for the private sector market in terms of private schools, and we can talk about that in the Q&A because I think it's a different, it's a different uh, customer. But in traditional public schools where you haven't seen a lot of technology infused, you have to provide a lot of support. The support in the early years or early months of an implementation is just as important as the software because you've got to get the teachers to get comfortable with it. Once they are comfortable, they will carry the water for you. But if you're just rolling out a product without actually that support, it'll have a real, real hard time actually getting real traction. Last area to talk about before I pause is the, the possibility what we've invested is around teacher collaboration and teacher improvement. So if you think about education, it's historically been the most one of the most isolated sectors there is, even though it should be the most collaborative. Right? The hardest thing to do as a teacher is figure out how do you actually teach 30 kids to get excited, inspired, to feel confident, to love math, to fall in love with world history. That's not something that one person can do really well. You want to collaborate as much as possible. Historically, educators are in a classroom isolated on their own entirely. Technology has the ability to completely blow that up and change it. When we started in the partnership schools, we said, hey, let's get teachers leaving their classrooms and visiting each other during the school day. There's a lot of benefit there, but the downside is they got to teach their class during the school day. So and a lot of teachers are like, hey, I don't want to leave my kids, or you got to spend money to get a sub, and there's no money to pay for subs for them to go visit other classrooms. So how do you create virtual communities so the teachers can collaborate with each other after school at different times, and it doesn't require me to just go visit a classroom? And also, how can you create virtual communities where maybe my teacher doesn't have the best math teacher in town, my school doesn't have the best math teacher in town, but a school five miles away, 10 miles away, or 40 miles away actually does? So now I can connect that incredible math teacher with all the math teachers in my network online, virtually, and collaboratively. So we just launched leveraging a product called Better Lessons, um, which is really about sharing lesson plans and also videos across uh, teachers. And, and they ha it's open to everybody, but you can create more customized networks. So we, with the partnership, have a partnership connect network where we're trying to get our teachers to be putting lesson plans, but more importantly, sharing videos of each other and then actually giving kind of good 
um, content around this video, so you're seeing a lot more collaboration amongst teachers. It, it takes a step because something like, hey, let's videotape ourselves, it's just not normal in the sector, so getting teachers to kind of step forward and be comfortable doing that is a big step forward, and you always gotta think about the implementation of these things, but our early teachers are very excited and positive about the, the potential of Partnership Connect, and um, we think that these kind of collaborative tools, as long as they make sense for teachers and you understand the mindset and, and what the teacher has on their plate and also understand the mindset of the administrators who have to support them, that we think there's huge potential to significantly improve the current capacity of teachers. Teachers have been getting a lot of bad raps in the media lately. There's a lot of committed people in our schools. We've gotta give them better tools to be more successful rather than kind of pound them all the time and say they're not doing well. There's a lot of good people who need better tools. And that's where I think a lot of the products that all of you are developing and that we're all trying to work on can be really, really exciting and fundamental. So those are some of the areas that we were very early in this work. As I mentioned, we didn't go heavy on technology our first two years. We saw good momentum with our early success, have pushed hard the last year and a half on implementing technology in math, in English, and around teacher collaboration. We've seen some really early good signs in terms of our student achievement, in terms of the feedback we're getting from teachers. And you can see it by how fast these things are rolling out in terms of teachers telling each other to get involved in what they're doing. We got a heck of a long way to go. Um, and there's a lot of challenges, I think, related to um, implementing technology, whatever, regardless of the product in the schools, which I think I can be helpful with um, as we have a conversation around this. And, and just wanted to close that um, we need as much help in this sector as possible. So I know a lot of folks, um, you know, you, when you're working, it's obviously around starting a business to raise some money and, and, and be successful in what you're doing. What's nice about doing this in education is you're actually not only going to hopefully be successful for yourselves, but literally working on the most important problem that we have in our country and working on a problem that we have an incredible potential to dramatically improve what's going on in classrooms throughout our cities and our country. Um, if we can get enough people behind it, enough good products involved, and I'm telling you from our perspective, and think of us as we're a mid-sized urban school district in the heart of LA, taking on the toughest schools, we are seeing really promising results that can have a lot of impact on a lot of kids' lives. So looking forward to the conversation, and, and with that, we'll turn it back over to Jason. Yeah. So Tyler, can you just grab a little water? Can you grab some water? Awesome. That's great. Wow, it's incredibly inspiring, and um, it's great um, that there are folks like you getting in there. Why did you choose to do this? I mean, you worked at enterprise so an enterprise software company. You worked as an investment banker. And then you took on this challenge. What, what was your thinking? Why did you personally decide uh, to put yourself into this incredibly challenging situation? So was, was, I was raised, um, kind of raised in a household where helping other people was, was emphasized. But my original plan was I'm going to go make a ton of money. And then much later in life, I'm going to go help people with that money. That was the original plan. Uh, went and invested in banking because that was the fastest path to make a bunch of money. Uh, then decided that wasn't making sense to me. I went and did some volunteer work uh, in Zimbabwe. and. Uh, met some incredible kids that I knew they were never going to reach their potential because they lived in a dictator government with no education system, no healthcare system. So right then I said, for me, the rest of my life is going to be about helping people have a better life. In our country, there is no question that it's the education system. If we improve it, will impact the most Americans of any social issue that we currently have. It's an infinitely solvable problem because the kids are just really talented, but we've got to completely shift the way we think about serving them. So that was, for me, it was, it was kind of values started with an inspirational journey in Zimbabwe, and then a desire to get busy on what I cared about most. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, let's talk about teachers. That was something that um, you, you touched on a lot. Teachers have been getting beat up in a major way in the press. The teachers are the problem. The teachers are the problem. They're unwilling uh, to adopt the new technology. Uh, there's no new teachers who are tech savvy. When we do get new teachers in who are tech savvy, they're the first to get laid off because seniority is what seems to drive at least the public school system. Um, does that match your experience, or is your experience they actually really want to do good? What's the truth there? Are, so, are there bad yeah. teachers who won't adopt technology and won't advance and who have given up? There isn't a sector in the country where there's not bad employees. Yeah. Right? So, like, I mean, every sector has some employees that don't make sense for that sector. Teachers have been getting a really bad rap uh, in this state, in this country. There's such a pounding on teachers the problem. If you just solve the union problem, if you just fire all the teachers, then everything will be solved. When they're out, that's just not the case. I mean, you, the, mo the vast majority of the teachers that I work with are committed to what they're doing. They're getting up early. They're driving a long way. They're going to jobs that are brutal. For the last four years, most of them are getting pink slips every March saying you may get fired, and they stick with it. And they actually are committed 
to getting better at what they're doing. Now they are, as you can imagine, a little bit at this point kind of distrustful of the, here's the guy in the suit with the new idea for this year and for next year and the following year. So there's right. a natural sense of defensiveness. But once you get through that, and if you give people tools that help them do their job and respect where they're coming from, you see people run with it. And, and, and we do have challenges. I mean, you can't just wish yourself to get better using technology if you haven't used it for a long time or if you haven't been involved in an environment where you're changing your practices often, it's going to take a little bit longer, but it doesn't change the fact that people want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually think the biggest, the people getting, big, getting the biggest pass in the sector have been principals and administration. Because if you think about like your companies, no one ever says, oh, the, the engineers are all a disaster. They're just terrible. If you would just you know, fire all the engineers and you'd say, hey, who are the entrepreneurs running these companies? Are they building the right environments? Are they giving the engineers the right tools or the marketing people the right tools? and education that we always pound in the teachers. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's definitely way too skewed the wrong way. There are rules that don't make sense that need to get changed. There's no doubt about that. Right. Tenure, you know, using student achievement to kind of think about teaching and performance, those are no-brainers, but that's, that, that isn't the only problem going on in education. So let's talk about implementing technology. A lot of entrepreneurs in the room, and we'll see them on stage. Um, you've put in a bunch of math and reading uh, software implemented for thousands of people, hundreds, and then in some cases thousands. What's the best way for a technology company to approach a school, um, especially a public school? And, and then you did mention there's a difference between a private school and a public school, so there's two questions there. Number one, what's the difference for me as an entrepreneur approaching each one, and what's the best practice for approaching the one that you're most familiar with, public schools? So I think, I think I'll start with the difference first. I mean, the, I mean, the challenge that I have in my job, because I'm working in public schools and also public schools in the toughest areas, I mean, the private schools just have a lot more money. So the natural place for entrepreneur organizations is to say, hey, th there's more money there. There's probably a little more embracing of technology. Let's focus our efforts there. Hey, if we're going to have a tutoring program, it's more likely wealthier parents that are looking to get tutoring programs for their kids. So on the one hand, it's, it's an easier market for a point of entry. The flip side is the public school market is just a much bigger market. There's a lot more dollars, even though the individual dollars are higher at a school level, in terms of you know, there's a $400 billion spent annually in this country on public education. So it's a bigger market. It's just a tougher market to actually sell into and get into. And I think that, that you know, when you think about working with public schools, I definitely advise you want to find a school system that's either very entrepreneurial or find a school system that works with partners like us that are entrepreneurial as your first point of entry. So one of the reasons that our partners like working with us is that we deal with traditional public schools, so we're at a big scale. Um, we understand like our teachers are representative of teachers throughout the country in public schools, but our organization really wants to embrace doing things differently, so they find us to be a good partner that's going to help support not just our teachers, but also people coming in to work with our schools, bring software solutions. If you're just trying to sell into a large traditional school system, it is extremely difficult because they're not used to making decisions on new products. Um, there's a very heavy risk averse uh, culture, very conservative culture in big school systems, but you're seeing... Because people might get fired if they yeah, make the wrong it, decision. If you think about, like, these are like the last great monopolies. And right. so for the last 30 years, it's all top, it's like completely top down. It's all about, I didn't make that decision, so I don't want to get in trouble. And people have gotten fired for bad decisions. You know, they're, they're not used to investing in, like, change requires losing some money. You know, you yeah, got to invest in learning. It, it, risk is required to drive change. And so, but there's a lot more public school systems that either are run by groups like ours or that are getting there, they're now more open to taking risk. And I think that's a great place for entrepreneurs to try to play. And I would advise you, even if you're selling into the private school market, you still want to play in the public school market because the behavior of, of the principals of the teachers is different. And so like the, the skills around adapting technology are going to be a little bit different. And as an organization, you can't do it all at once, but you want to learn both those things so frankly you can have the greatest impact on the market and the greatest impact for your revenue. Uh, one of the big trends in our industry, enterprise software or um, consumer software, is the concept of freemium. Try before you buy or use it to a point, and then if you want uh, to use it anymore, we'll charge you or we'll simply upsell you on the, this feature set, but you get the overwhelming majority for free. Uh, do you think that's a great strategy for going into public schools, offering this product for free up to a thousand students and then turning it on or turning it off for the administrator tools and has anybody approached you with the freemium model yet? So I think in California public schools some creative model to get started and show you can do it is essential. There's just we have such little money in the state right now we are we've cut funding by 20 percent in the last four years in the state of California we were 43rd out of 50 states four years ago we're now 47th 
If the initiative in November does not pass, we will be 50th in the country in terms of per pupil funding. We spent out $7,000 a kid in California fully loaded. A place like New Jersey spending $15,000 a kid. Uh, there's just not a ton of room. So that doesn't mean that there's not money to be made or value to be added to kids. What it means is you got really creative about the first sale and the proof point. And your first couple projects have got to be successful. So for us, like the big light bulb for us was our pilot with ST Math was really successful. Our teachers liked it, they embraced it, our kids loved it, and their results improved. Um, and that, that then gave us kind of the confidence to, to do more with it. We obviously also go and raise private money. The good news is there are private funders in you know, philanthropic dollars that will also now help jumpstart some of the technology solutions. So our, our creation with Better Lessons was um, they have a free product, but they have some really good value-added services for a network, kind of good analytics on what they're doing. You can really customize things for the partnership network. You can brand it. So we, we kind of saw what they had broadly that was for free. We like what they had. We raised a little bit of money to then fund a pilot for what they're doing. And, and our teachers like it, so we're going to keep paying for it. And one other thing that we think about in California, where there is an opportunity, there's a bunch of money right now spent on textbooks. That's going away in the next five, hopefully five, you know, maybe seven years. We're slower than we should be in this sector. But it's going to free up a bunch of money for software. So that's what we've been telling our, uh, like when, we, when I pitch funders, when I'm trying to raise money, we have a $6.5 million campaign right now. We've raised $3 million. We're trying to raise $3.5 million more. My raising isn't from VC. I mean, it was from VC guys, but they're philanthropic dollars, not their uh, investing dollars from the VC. But um, it's, it's, hey, get us $6.5 million. We can scale blended learning through 2015, and then we believe there's going to be enough freed up dollars from the textbook transition where we can use that money to pay for software. So there are some trends going on that's going to free up some dollars, even a constrained budget, that's going to put people in position to buy the right kind of software if, if they believe the software works well. What's the impact of open courseware, free open source courseware, as opposed to buying you know, $100 textbooks that haven't changed and people feel like we're kind of ripping off schools and that these sweetheart deals for textbooks mm -hmm. are just ridiculous. And um, all this open courseware is now being put out, whether it's Khan Academy, take two drinks, um, uh, or you know, other services now. Well, this open courseware out there, is it going to make its way into the public school system? Or are the lobbyists and the evil people trying to sell these textbooks at outrageous prices going to win? The lobbyists will not win. Uh, they're effective, so uh, they make it much slower than it should be, um, but they won't win. And I can say that because I, I can walk. The fun part of my job is I walk classrooms, East LA, Watts, South Central, and I see teachers using the open open source. I mean, the open tech curriculum right in front of my face. So you you'll in different kinds, like really cool stuff. You know, you, you'll go and you'll see two drinks, Khan Academy here or there, but you'll also like I went in and some teacher had really cool math games. I said, what'd you do? She's like, I just went to Google. I Googled math, seventh grade, CST. CST is a California standardized test, the content standardized test for the state. Prepar preparation, and she had like six free games come up, and she liked two of them. So you see it on the ground. It's going to happen. Um, the, the and it will be ground up, clearly. It, it's definitely ground up. And there's some push top down, but the lobbies are very powerful uh, in California, but it's, it's, it's turning. And the other piece is the software's got to get there a little bit further. So I actually was having um, a conversation um, with Saul Khan, and I said, hey, am I crazy for paying for software right now? And, and the, the answer was, their stuff, it's, it's really strong, but they're still, mass, vast majority of their market is people on their own kind of learning the, their own kind of tutoring and pieces of subjects versus in the state of California, we have standards we have to teach kids for seventh grade. So the software's got to also make sense with the standards. You can't force the teachers to be the ones to decipher standards, your software, and make it all make sense for the kids. So that, but the, I think the, the free software is catching up, and that's, um, that's definitely where it's going. Maybe we take a couple questions from the audience, and if you could identify uh, if you're a founder uh, or a teacher or an administrator or a venture capitalist. Anybody have any questions for Marshall? I see one right here or there. Hey there, I'm a combination of a teacher and a founder. Um, I teach at a school where um, we have, we certainly have a very wonderful and supportive administration, but both from a funding and from an institutional capacity perspective, we're not gonna be able to get much technology specifically to the school and support it. Um, for a founder who's trying to focus on selling to teachers, where's that intersection of profitability and at the same time delivering value in the classroom, delivering increased achievement in the classroom? Because it seems like in my school, a solution where the school is to purchase something isn't going to work as well as the teachers being able to make decisions about um, something specifically they can buy for their classroom. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I, I think that the, the balance of kind of pro, I think I get the question balance of like profitability and, and how can you make money versus the challenges of there not being money and, and teachers being constrained. Is that kind of the crux of the question? Um, th this is why I think we have the creative models around thinking of both private and public schools, and and you, you can't necessarily differentiate your cost structure, but um, you can get creative. Like our partner Revolution Prep, they charge us a very different price than they charge either individual families that use their project at retail, because a lot of folks will actually sell a retail product to families, and then they'll also sell an institu in institutional product to high poverty schools like ours. So that's one way to think about the difference on the model. Um, I think you do need to make sure, though, that you're working with schools, to your point, where the teachers and principals are empowered. You do not, like big bureaucracies where they're making the centralized decisions, they're losers. Like you may make, get that first sale because you have a friend who knows a friend who can make the purchasing decision, but you're toast after that because there won't be any sort of implementation. You gotta find places where they believe at the core of the school system that teachers and principals should be making key decisions. And then at least that point, you're gonna be sure that with the limited money they have, they're gonna, the teachers and principals will buy the solutions that they think can solve their problem and their kids' problem as fast as possible. But I think from a business model perspective, in California, you gotta get creative or else move beyond California, but include California as another way to think about private public or cross state with some California sales. Another question. Uh, I'm Tyler, and uh, I'm neither a founder nor a teacher, just a manager. Um, but aside from the specific system that you mentioned as far as uh, your teachers collaborating uh, using that online system, I guess in a, um, a scenario where they don't have that, you did mention how if a teacher adopts a piece of technology, they, they kind of spread that. Um, what, I guess from your experience, have you used to kind of facilitate that, that spreading of uh, teacher to teacher? I mean, do they call each other up after work? Do they all hang out at conferences? Mm -hmm. What? Um, yeah, how do you make it viral? Yeah. For so this is, we got a long way to go as a sector, and I, just to clarify, we've seen momentum on teacher to teacher, but there's, there's some schools where the cultures are trickier, but that's, it's definitely the best way to go. We're trying to invest now in actually giving teacher, like creating a master teacher, Kind of or a pioneer teacher where we find three to five highly influential teachers at each school site and have that kind of be an anchor point for connecting to other teachers and giving them a little bit of a stipend so that we're not relying just solely on hey people to use their own time and energy to go and spread it so we're actually kind of funding or trying to fund our core teachers the teachers who are really good at what they do who are respected by their peers and who are interested in actually both engaging in new ways to teach for themselves as well as sharing with their peers. And we think that should be elevated and made exciting. And what you can do with that also is right now in this sector, if you want to improve, you got to go be a principal. Whereas how can we create better jobs for teachers who want to be teachers but can also be really effective at um, working with their peers? So we think that's the best model for sharing is, is supporting teachers to be the ones and frankly paying them to do so. Let's take a final question right here in the red shirt. Broderick Turner, uh, I was a high school math teacher until two weeks ago, and I start uh, the Analyst Fellowship of Education Pioneers in uh, a month. Um, my question is this, what product or services uh, do you wish you had now that you have not seen yet? That's a great question, thank you for that. That's a question that requires five seconds of thought, it is a great question. Yeah, um, I mean, is it behavior, is it teacher education and development? I mean, I keep hearing pitches on student behavior. Do you, while you're thinking, do you buy into that? Like teachers pressing a button every time a child misbehaves or does something good? Is that? Uh, no, I've heard this pitch well, of, you know. I, mean, I, I definitely, I would say we, the biggest gap, I mean, there's a lot of things out there, but the special education population and products that better serve special education, and that ranges, just so folks who don't completely know, that can range from a, um, a special needs students that has real kind of, um, physical handicaps or mental handicaps, as well as kind of emotionally disturbed student who has kind of serious psychological or emotional issues. There's not, it, it's, it's with, even though we spend a lot of money as a country, we do not know what works really well for those young people. And I think that this is a place where technology can have some really exciting impacts, but it's early, it's a tough market. And so when we sit back as an organization, we have tons of challenges, but one where we're really far on is how do we best serve it's such a diverse, like kids are diverse as it is. Within special needs, it's so diverse in terms of what is the best way to support young people who have real, unique, either physical, uh, mental, or emotional needs. And so I think to me, I don't know what that product would look like, so it's not, it's well, not actually, the best yeah, product-based answer. The, but um, 
I guess for people with Asperger's or attention deficit yeah, disorder exactly. and so dyslexia, they've made some iPad apps that seem to allow them to communicate or lower anxiety that have been and, pretty and effective. And I've seen some good stuff around like speech therapy. So, yeah. so th those those products that now that you know they're tighter markets and it's trickier. But I think there's but on the side note, there's huge private like there's a lot of as you see more and more needs being diagnosed. There are a lot of wealthy families who want to get more support for their kids. So it's something you could see kind of starting a product, selling it to wealthier individuals, right. and then working it way back to the public school system. Awesome. Well, this has been an amazing discussion. Let's hear it from Marshall Tuck. Thank um, you. And